The idea that technology will displace drivers or more importantly, displace jobs is ill-founded, said by Ken Washington. He is Ford's chief technology officer. 2018, this tweet was said by Ken Washington. This is the living street. Ford is thinking big about how to improve human lives. In the city of tomorrow, cars and streets will work as a system with an underlying operating code and artificial intelligence, smart vehicles in a smart world. Those things are echoed not just by Ford, but by the entire electric revolution. Of course, you know that Forbes is also introducing North America's largest electric vehicle charging the network. So they've got the Ford charging stations as well. Just wanted to highlight them uh, in case a lot of people aren't aware. Take note that Ford Mustang Mach-E customers are going to receive up to five complimentary fill-ups at Electrify America charging stations. And amongst these electric vehicles, I wanted to share that one sector that is directly going to benefit is actually additive manufacturing. Yes, Additive manufacturing is the next frontier for the manufacturing industry. We are actually in the fourth industrial revolution. So today's topic, guys, is 3D printing, robotics, metallurgy, engineering, and continuous composites manufacturing. Now, there are a ton of applications in medical, in, uh, in just consumer electronics, even your electric vehicles. But the point of this is that what it means with industrial revolution is that it's everything. It's the internet of things. It's everything. So let's take a look at what a 3D printed bus actually looks like. This could be your next ride. Let's watch this. Printing in progress. Please stand clear. Printing. 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 Assembling navigation system. Energizing flux capacitor. Installing artificial intelligence. Your vehicle is ready. For 100 years, we've been making vehicles pretty much the same way, the assembly line. And it's efficient. A large modern factory can roll out thousands of vehicles per day. But it isn't very flexible when it comes to changing designs very often. Here in Knoxville, Tennessee, a company called Local Motors is taking a different approach. Have they discovered the way of the car making future? That's what I'm here to find out. So is this the biggest 3D printer in the world? As far as I know, yes. As of this moment, this is the world's largest commercial large-scale additive manufacturing machine. Can you explain how something's actually made with this machine? Yeah, certainly. Whatever it is that you, you want to make, what we do is put it into a program. That's the instruction set that tells the machine what to do and where to go. And based on that pattern, we deposit material and in a layer by layer fashion, you start building up your shape. Local Motors prints the chassis of its vehicles out of a composite material that's about as hard as a traditional metal car body once it cools. And then if you really want it to be very precise, then you can come back in and you can machine it. You can take that material off and get those precise edges, those hard contours and shapes. About how long does something take to make? Um, something like a vehicle chassis it takes about nine hours. Stick on a few non-3D printed items like wheels and headlights, and the result is one of the company's sleek looking all electric cars. The company gets its vehicle designs through a sort of crowdsourcing process, in which engineers from all around the world submit designs and competition for cash, prizes, and royalties on the finished car. So if I had a design I wanted to bring and have you guys print, like how detailed does that design need to be? You just need the basic uh, CAD model, your computer-aided design, and we can work from there. We can take this one machine and we can change what it produces 
very easily because that's just done in a computer file. When I hear 3D printer, I usually think about the MakerBot-style desktop machines that were all the rage in the early 2010s, when it seemed like everyone was going to have a 3D printer in their house within a few years. In reality, though, the major advances in adoption of 3D printing have been happening behind the scenes, used for applications ranging from building houses in developing countries to printing living human tissue. It's morphed into a $10 billion industry that's projected to more than triple by 2024. But back in 2014, when Local Motor CEO Jay Rogers first started trying to 3D print entire cars, things were a little different. 3D printing had been used to make individual car parts, but printing an entire car body was another question entirely. There were far many more naysayers than there were supporters, people who said it can't be done or it shouldn't be done. No one had ever done it. Uh, nothing, to my knowledge, had ever been done at that scale, right? So it was less about the fact that it was a car, more about the fact that it was larger and 3D printed. Faced with a daunting engineering challenge, Local Motors reached out to Oak Ridge National Laboratory, a Knoxville-based government facility that was instrumental in the creation of the first atomic bomb. They were developing giant 3D printers, and they agreed to help Local Motors make the first 3D printed car ever live at an international trade show in full public view. We said, let's 3D print the first vehicle in the world and assemble it and drive it off the show floor right there. That was the goal. It was very nervous making because we were getting close by the time we went to the show, but we were still failing in some of the prints. And so we were very nervous that we would get to the show and fail. How did it go? It was successful. And this is the result, the Strati. How you doing driving, by the way? I love this. It's pretty simple, right? Man, it's like second nature. It's smooth. I mean, it's somewhere in between a golf cart and like a, a dune buggy, you know? I mean, it's nimble. You're so low to the ground that you just feel very stable. Yeah. We had limitations, so like our roll bar that's back here, as you'll note, it's a little shorter than my head because the printer wasn't, at the time, capable to go up higher. What would you say the top speed is of this configuration? I think this configuration should be 25 miles an hour. I don't know, what would you say? Does it feel like we're zipping along? I feel like we could hit about 25, yeah. Feels about right. <laughs> Maybe on a downhill 30. Yeah. <laughs> the Strati proved that a 3D printed car was possible, but as a car, there wasn't much to it and it's never really been commercialized. The company's first 3D printed production vehicle, the Ollie, is a bit more interesting. Ollie is a electric, connected, self-driving, 3D printed vehicle. It's a cute little box. In Japanese, it would be called a hako. And it is meant to driverlessly deliver people to places around a campus. A few Ollies have already made it out into the world, like here at National Harbor, just outside Washington, DC. They can run completely autonomously on a fixed route, though a human still rides along to take over when the AI can't figure out exactly what to do. So right now, are we in autonomous mode? Or yeah. Are we no, no, we're in autonomous mode. So right now, we're in a geofence fixed route kind of environment. In the future, we could do uh, dynamic routing where people could actually call the Ali, um, just similar to an Uber or a Lyft. What happens if, like, someone steps into the middle of the crosswalk or something? You know? Well, yeah, so obviously if the vehicle perceives the pedestrian or cyclist stepping in, the vehicle will stop. So, for example, right now it just saw that vehicle and it gave it the right of way. Right. So it understands what obstacles are there and then how to avoid them. It's amazing how quickly it feels, like, totally natural. Like, I just don't even... Right. Think you, about it anymore. You, you, know? you haven't turned people, around the whole time, right? I haven't you, checked you, the driver. Like, yeah. he's still awake. Right? Right. It doesn't matter, right? Yes. Um, do you like driving? I mean, would you miss it if it all became autonomous? I, I think there is a set of people that will always want to drive. But I think in the future, you will have vehicles that are allowed to be driven on certain tracks for specially licensed and trained people. And then the rest of us will all 
drive in a connected, automated, shared mobility solution. I'm going to stop you right there. What you just saw in that video is actually the product of one of our awesome 10X picks. The connected cars are actually able to see autonomously with Velodyne LiDAR. Indeed, if you studied your company very well, Local Motors is actually the client of VLDR, Velodyne LiDAR, if you remember, the eyes of the driver. So connected cars, you've heard about that. Who is the leader of connected cars again? Do people know? It is Sterens. These are all awesome 10x picks that we've shared in 2020. But isn't that amazing that you can actually print your car in the future? And it's not even the far future because that happened 2020, last year. What are the things that are happening in the additive manufacturing industry? In a 2019 report, they said it's going to be $40 billion or $30 billion in the next five years. And today, with all the rage of Biden in clean energy, one of the ways that you can actually print is to just print solar cells. So why don't we watch how Australia is printing the largest solar cells? Let's watch. Two minutes. One minute. We're really pleased to commission what is now Australia's largest facility for printing thin film solar cells. This equipment that has been purchased over the last few months and commissioned in our labs here in Melbourne will enable us to print A3 size solar cells. We've rapidly scaled up making our devices from fingernail size in the lab to A3 size devices that are fully printed now. And at this size, we're definitely up there with the best in the world. In the short term, we're looking for applications in consumer devices and small integrated electronics. In the longer term, we see these materials being able to be coated onto buildings, into windows and on roofs to provide power in a wide variety of locations and circumstances. What we're doing truly is additive manufacturing. We're taking simple substrates such as plastic or steel and coating them and turning them into solar cells. This is what a factory of the future looks like, and it's based here in Melbourne's emerging manufacturing precinct. I just wanted you to know that the manufacturing facilities of the future have a lot of automation and a lot of actually additive manufacturing. So let's try to explain what these additive manufacturings are. Yes, it is a 30-year-old industry. Additive manufacturing refers to adding material to create an object. It uses data from a computer-aided design, CAD software, to direct the hardware to deposit the material layer upon layer in precise geometric shapes. It started in 1980, the infancy, and then the additive 1.0, they said, is 2001. Today, we're actually in the 2020, which is additive 2.0. 2020 to beyond, today we can actually print cars. So the first version was actually just about SLA and FDM. It is like fuse diffusion, um, I forgot, but some modeling, that, that's it. It's really about just prototyping. Rapid prototyping is tightly interwoven into this part of the history much less uh, RP instead of 3D printing. So it, mo it was more of rapid prototyping rather than 3D printing. However, in 2016, additive, additive manufacturing using FDM and SLS remain the primary form of the 3D printer and have been mainly used. So this era was actually uh, called additive manufacturing 1.0, all about prototypes. The inflection point happened around 2006 and 2016 as the market has surged. What happened? Additive manufacturing 2.0. It reached an application point where the applications went from simple design and tooling to mass production of final components. This shift is what we call the emergence of what is referred to as additive manufacturing 2.0. We are unlocking throughput, repeatability, and competitive part costs. In one of the companies, actually, that we'll feature, Desktop Metal said that they could do 100 times speed at one-fifth of, uh, sorry, 
one fifth or one tenth of the cost. So it's either 10x or 20x cheaper. Sorry, one over 20. You mentioned 100 times speed at 10x the cost because a machine will never run out of a uh, day and night. It will just print and print and print. So um, the cost of production is going to go, go down, especially with the cost of production lowering down with the advent of cheap electricity. So you will be able to get so many cheap cars in the world because of additive manufacturing. This is one part of the solution. The key additive manufacturing technologies enabling this shift are actually desktop metal printers. Desktop metal went in through a SPAC. There was actually um, an inner circle pick. We got TRNE, aka desktop metal, at about 10 to 11. Today it's trading at 24. But I will discuss to you why it remains still a strong conviction hold. You can even buy as it goes down if it even falls. Now, there's also other companies like Mark Forged and Metal X. They're not listed. And also, you have to understand that today, yes, you can actually print medical devices and also print heart, an artificial heart, an artificial ear, artificial everything can actually be done today. So you can actually 3D print human parts, human body parts. It is what we call continuous fiber placement or printing. And the companies that are leading here are actually continuous composites, Arivo, Siad, 90 Labs, Ad Composites. For purpose of explanation, I will show to you continuous composites. It's not listed, but, ha but if it is, yes, it is an awesome 10x pick. These are solutions that are key innovations across hardware, material, and software, and pull additive manufacturing into direct competition, displacing conventional traditional processes today which are actually manufacturing $12 trillion in goods annually. Can you imagine that? They are displacing legacy manufacturing processes. Therefore, there's been a new wave of investments in companies like Desktop Metal. In a SPAC deal, they raised $275 million. Today, it's actually $2.5 billion. I think right now, I'm not sure if it's $2.5 billion or is it $5 billion. Let me just make sure um, because it doubled already. I, can't, I, I think I remember it was $2.5 um, $2 billion market cap, but it doubled. So right now, it's at five. Yeah, it doubled. So it's now at $5 billion. So yeah. Um, the market is opportunistic, uh, is seeing the opportunities that a desktop metal can do to disrupt manufacturing in general. Now, you are seeing some companies still in the Series D. Uh, some of these are actually listed and we discuss them. Do you remember Nano Dimension? At that point in time, Nano Dimension was still trading at $2. Today, Nano Dimension is trading at about uh, 5x. Um, 5x at the very least. Nano dimension market cap. Okay, 6x already. We featured it at $2. It's now trading at $13. So um, it's now trading at $2.61 billion. So from about, um, yeah, so that is an amazing move for desktop metal. Most, most especially this went 52 week low just last year. This was a 50 cent company that is now trading at $12. You heard me right. If you put in um, 10,000 shares, 50 cents, that would be $5,000. That $5,000 is roughly $126,000 today. Amazing. And that's a year. Because indeed, additive manufacturing is such an amazing technology. These are some of the companies that are not yet listed, but Something that you should be aware of. Additive Industries, Valo, Comovis, Azul, Dimension. I, if I remember correctly, Arivo and, uh, and, and, com and Composite, Continuous Composite actually emerged. So these are some parts of the thing on the, uh, in the era of additive manufacturing. Fiber placement systems themselves have become 100 times more accessible. Because the material has also reduced in price, more and more companies are investing in manufacturing efficiency, enabling aerospace-grade technology to become available to other industries. It should be well known to you that additive manufacturing actually was a function of people investing in aerospace, so rocket ships. 
This enabled the prices of final components into direct competition with conventional composite shops. The digitized process has its benefits with consistent quality, safer work environment, optimal material usage. Guys, and I read that in the in current states, because of COVID pandemic, it has been the desktop metal printers that were printing a lot of uh, necessities instead of, of course, the, the, the risk of actually having factory uh, open. So it has been machines uh, working nonstop for the production of so many things that we need. Something as ubiquitous as even the electric vehicles that you will purchase in the future. Now, take note, during recent years, this is true, additive manufacturing AM processes have offered reduced cost and time. In fact, I was watching a lot of videos that they were saying it's not a luxury, it is a necessity. If additive manufacturing is so practical, multiple small parts can be built simultaneously, you've got production efficiency inversely proportional to part size, the process is enabling so many organizations to produce tools um, in many regions. Example, the FDM is called Fused de de Deposition Modeling of Continuous Fiber Reinforced Plastics. So today we actually have the combination of additive manufacturing and composite materials. The continuous composites will allow new frontiers for manufacturing of spaceship components and structures, allowing the production of ultra strong stuff. Now take a look at some slides from desktop metal itself. They didn't talk about trillions of dollars in industry, although they tried to predict that today we're hitting about $12 billion in market, um, in market size for the additive manufacturing. But with more and more electric company vehicles, or not just that, we're talking about later other industries, aerospace, medical, even consumers, even just jewelries, even your sneakers like Adidas, it could grow to as high as $150 billion in the next 10 years. You're going to see a 10x move or a, bit, uh, or a little bit more than 25% Kager year on year. So guys, if you didn't buy desktop metal at 11 and you're buying at 24, don't you actually want to tell yourself how stupid you are for not buying 11 and how more stupid you are if you're going to stop at 24 thinking that you're late, right? Agree or disagree, that's what I think. Today, there's rapid development in artificial intelligence and robotics. Automation is really at a tipping point, or it's not even a tipping point, it's here. Robots can perform a slew of functions without considerable human intervention. Additive manufacturing, commonly known as 3D printing, offers unrivaled design freedom with the ability to manufacture parts from a wide range of materials. But let's begin with the simple things. Look at just manufacturing your own customized design, your own Adidas. This is the new 4D Fusio model from Adidas conforming 3D printed midsoles and they're here to stay and they're getting more colorful. This is a January, 18, 20, January 8, 2021 article, which means it was just about two days, two weeks ago. Let's watch because these are brands that you and I know, Adidas, Nike, Reebok, they're making 3D shoes in their factory. This is future 3D printing technologies. This is actually a three-year-old video. Let me show you and tell you how to understand the future. Watch. This is Liquid Factory and this is your classification of liquid. But oxygen inhibits it. That allows us to have the object grow. What's really interesting about this collaboration with carbon is we're seeing a convergence. set us on a path. It's a mindset and it's a philosophy to try things. We're always bringing in new influences, new ideas, new collaborations. 3D printing, for example, was one of these new technologies that really had unlimited possibilities. You know, the initial problem was, okay, can we actually make a running shoe out of 3D printed material that really works and works well? So when we started thinking about doing 3D printing, we wanted to use liquids because liquids give you the most flexibility in material design. I think of light as a chisel. Light triggers the solidification of the liquid, but oxygen inhibits it. 
that allows us to have the object grow. What's really interesting about this collaboration with Carbon is we're seeing a convergence of a completely new manufacturing technology. We're going to scale it with the best industrial partner in the business. We're able to deliver tens of thousands and moving to hundreds of thousands and into the tens of millions. You know, that's clear in front of us. We have this amazing opportunity to innovate the printing process, the liquid rising. And growing in that context can give you new design thoughts you've never had before and new performance capabilities that wouldn't be possible by traditional manufacturing. This three-dimensional mesh structure, it's a lattice, it's a matrix, it's a web of individual elements. Each one of those little elements is tuned specifically for a purpose. These lattice structures behave quite differently than anything we've dealt with before. They're much different than foams. Now we have every individual area of the shoe to work with, which is a completely new horizon for us and a new venture. If you really want to make a shoe that's a size nine, that same shoe for someone who's 180 pounds versus 100 pounds has got to be different. We can go in within every single cell and engineer that exact cell to do exactly what the consumer needs it to do just for them. That next week that was making footwear, you'd see essentially the same thing. Every shoe from every brand on the market is created using molds. Shoes are expensive because molds are expensive. What if we created a new process to make shoes without molds? We'd get a lot faster and we'd change what we make, how we make it, where we make it, and who we make it with. This is the Liquid Factory Lab. It's unlike any other shoe lab anywhere. We're using state-of-the-art manufacturing software and machinery to build a system that literally draws shoes in three dimensions. We had to give our machine something to draw with. That's the liquid part of Liquid Factory, a special high-rebound liquid. I'm going to stop that, but this is actually a very interesting video telling you how the companies that are making the sneakers are actually working with Carbon 3D. This is uh, I know I have next the future of custom sneakers could be 3D printed. It's not here, no worries. I have a lot of those videos. I'll check wait up. Okay, let's watch. Um, I find this action.
Hi, pardon for that. I'm back. So um, let me just share my screen first. Um, hi. As I was saying, uh, this is actually the future of your sneakers. Let's try to watch this video from Adidas. It's uh, by Carbon 3D. Welcome to Carbon. We're a technology company changing the way the world makes things. Specifically, 3D printed things. We didn't start out trying to change manufacturing forever. We didn't? No, we didn't. We started with the simple goal of making 3D printed parts better. It's 25 to 100 times faster, which is game changing. But we quickly realized that with our combination of technology and materials, we could make real parts with mechanical properties and surface finishes that make injection molded plastics obsolete by comparison. Embracing the idea that speed to production isn't an obstacle anymore. It's the only way forward. And our partners share our enthusiasm for reinventing the rules. Partners who are manufacturing at scale, making millions of real products. Like us? Yeah, like you. In partnership with Adidas, we've created a midsole that shouldn't exist so that they could make a shoe that shouldn't exist. Light, super flexible, highly durable, and printed straight from liquid. A marvel of design and function, this shoe defies logic. And whether you want to make one or one million, this is true, customizable, and on-demand mass manufacturing. This is not a publicity stunt. This is a revolution. And we're just getting started. Stop prototyping. Start producing. Indeed, that is a science lab project made real. So Dr. Us, how do I say him? Dr. Simone, who was talking in a TEDx five years ago, is now the CEO of his own company, Carbon 3D, and they have a partnership with Adidas. Not just Adidas. Let me share with you a few more things about Carbon 3D. Indeed, the future of custom sneakers could be printed. Wall Street Journal talked about their company as well. We, we don't need to watch the same thing over and over. But uh, Carbon 3D is a private company by Dr. Joseph De Simone. He founded it seven years ago. He actually discussed it in a TED Talk. And uh, what does Carbon 3D? Carbon 3D actually in 2016 got $81 million for their international expansion of their rapid 3D printing technology. It's Mr. Joseph and Philip De Simone, Alex and Nikita Ermoshkin, Edward Somolsky, and Steve Nelson. Carbon is in California, and they manufacture and develop 3D printers using the continuous liquid interface production process. In April 2017, Adidas announced the first 3D printed midsole developed using carbon technology. The Adidas Fusion 4D is also carbon 3D. 3D printing status um, unicorn raised $200 million from Adidas and others at the $1.7 billion valuation. This was 2017, three years ago. How Adidas cracked the code of 3D printed shoes, uh, September 11, 2017, that is written in the Fast Company. Adidas Future Craft 4D, a winner in the 2017 Innovation by Design Awards, is the first 3D printed running shoe to deliver on the promise of mass customization. But it hasn't been easy getting here. You'll notice that Carbon and Desktop Metal are actually the smartest companies by 2017, said by MIT Technology Review. Now, just in case you're wondering who was the number one in MIT's thoughts, it was NVIDIA. So don't worry, in the top 50 smart companies, Tesla was also part of that. SpaceX was also part of that. Either way, you could see the 3D printing is actually so many applications. People are saying 3D printing for everyone, toys or whatever in the house household. Can you print a human kidney? Seven years ago, there was a thought process of it. Today, you can actually do so. How 3D printing is enabling the fourth industrial revolution. It started from just rapid prototyping and modeling. Today, you're actually enabling these 3D printers or additive manufacturing 2.0 to actually print things that you can never even imagine a person to do. Only a computer could. 
3D printing evolution 10 months ago, how 3D printing disrupted the supply chain. Today, almost all of the solar panels in some countries are actually 3D printed. How 3D printing is actually working with medical applications. This is actually the specific 3D printing talk of Dr. Joseph Desimone. What if 3D printing was 100 times faster? Now, we always talk about here 10x technologies. What about 100 times faster, 10x or 20 times cheaper? So these are the amazing game-changing companies that we are actually going to discuss. This is 10 minutes, but you can watch it yourself. Um, this is one of the companies that are amazing in my, in, my, um, in my analysis. The company's name is Continuous Composites. It's not listed. Continuous Composites does continuous fiber, 3D printing, a fundamental shift in composites manufacturing. For all you know, it could be bought. It might be a buyout somewhere in the future, or it could even SPAC. So it's still important for us to watch what Tyler Alvarado does. Is he the next Elon Musk? In my view, yes. Watch this. Three minutes. You guys have all heard about the hype within the additive manufacturing space. What you haven't heard is about 3D printing composites using continuous fiber. And we want to show you guys how revolutionary the technology is and we own the future of 3D printing. We have developed a new 3D printing technology that allows you to create the entire structure in one piece. We're creating the structure by harnessing the power of carbon fiber and other composite materials with the ability to fully embed fiber optics and copper wire. Currently, carbon fiber is only used in high-end applications due to the high manufacturing cost. The composite field has been limited to working on molds and having big autoclaves and yet here we are revolutionizing this technology. We are making it so that it can print in free space. We are doing something that nobody has done before. What we have is patented technology on 3D printing with continuous fiber, where we're extruding any sort of continuous fiber, whether it be carbon fiber, fiberglass. We can use aramids like Kevlar. We're also embedding functional wire into our composite parts that we're printing. And we're actually using a UV curable resin, which allows us to cure instantaneously the moment we extrude the fiber from the nozzle. With the priority date dating back to August of 2012, we own the earliest patent on 3D printing with continuous fiber. Really what excites me is that this is kind of a revolutionary process when it comes down to uh, the traditional way of composites manufacturing. You know, a lot of composites manufacturing requires a lot of hand skills, a lot of man hours to do a lot of these things, and we are coming up with an automated way. What this allows us to do is orient fibers unique to their stress points and not deposit materials where we don't need them. So we're able to print print parts lighter, faster, and stronger. Our technology opens up the realm of manufacturing and design possibilities. This technology is the future of manufacturing. None of this is possible with any other 3D printing process that exists today. The ways that you are going to be able to make things in the future because of the technology being developed in continuous composites are yet to be known and will completely revolutionize manufacturing as we know it. This technology is so powerful and is truly the next industrial revolution. And what we're doing at Continuous Composites is bringing together the technology ecosystem comprised of material suppliers, OEM customers, machine vendors, software developers to truly unlock the power of this technology. Remember that name, guys. Tyler Alvarado is going to be a billionaire. And not just that, he's going to be multi-billionaire. Continuous Composites and Siemens, Simons, is that how you did, uh, really, I don't know, Simons, collaborated. Let's see how they're working together. Watch this. One minute. The first time I saw Continuous Composites, I immediately went to their website. And when I saw the ability to print in free space, I was completely hooked. I knew that this was an emerging technology that we needed to be involved with. CF3D 
fueled by Siemens technology, is introducing large-scale composite additive manufacturing to industries that aren't able to manufacture composites. By leveraging Siemens state-of-the-art cinematic controllers with six-axis robot arms, we are able to print at very fast speeds, accurately and highly repeatable. We definitely saw the synergies and agreed that the 840D was the controller they needed to be able to have very accurate industry standard programming for a robot. CF3D is enabling Siemens to reduce cost, lead times, and offer a significant value proposition to many of their customers across different business units. Continuous Composites process is challenging the standard of composites that we feel is the future. And anytime that you can see a cohesive team developing a product, you're gonna find a product that's worth having. Our partnership with Siemens is built on a foundation of trust. We are excited to penetrate these new industries and see where this technology can go together. New crush, Tyler Alvarado. Let's go for the next. Okay. Um, with all that said, I know that some of you are interested in the market caps of these companies. Desktop Metal, aka TRNE, is now trading at $24. It's now a $5 billion company. Any drops, I guess, 10% will going to be support at 21. We mentioned to buy it at about 11, 10, 11, 12. We still added about 16, 17. And today, even at 21, you want to actually, if it's 24 right now. So if you in, if you still want to enter, you could enter a few, very just few at 24 in case it goes all time highs, which we, I mean, in the end, my reality check is that this is actually perhaps a $50 billion company. Or it's, I don't know, maybe I'm too bullish. But the point here is that I think that it's going to go $100 someday. So any drops from about 25 all the way to 20, all the way to about 15 should actually be bought. Now, um, there are companies that are also interesting in the 3D printing labs. Um, it's called Proto Labs. Proto Labs has already risen from about $60 to $190. I will discuss what Proto Labs does. Proto Labs is currently helping uh, Lockheed Martin for drones taking flight. You can actually watch this one minute video about them. But as you could read, to get its new Indigo quadcopter off the ground and into a soaring market for commercial drones, Lockheed Martin turned to Proto Labs for rapid prototyping and on demand production. The aerospace, defense, and technology giant used Proto Labs automated DFM designed for manufacturability and coating system to quickly move the drones from 3D printed prototypes to injection molded parts, accelerating the time to market. The key to everything is that if you can have speed, then you can have the cost produced lower. And it's kind of like math. You remember when you were in grade school that they were asking about the human labor. Um, how many days can you finish a house? Well, with these types of uh, technologies, we can actually probably print a car in five hours. And we can probably print a house in maybe less than five hours too, if it's just going to be uh, co continuous, right? So watch this video if you want to understand how Proto Labs does drones. Watch. Oops. Anyway, it uh, doesn't matter. I'll show you more videos later on. But Proto Labs in their website says manufacturing accelerated. Indeed, they also produce and bring robotic ex exoskeletons to life with their digital manufacturing. It engineers at motion and control tech leader Parker Hannifin needed to accelerate the development speed and reduce the design risk of their robotic exoskeletons. A combination of digital manufacturing technologies and automated coating enabled a highly iterative design process without sacrificing the time to market. So in Proto Labs, they always said digital manufacturing for medical development. We are here to accelerate development, reduce the design risk, and get the medical products to the market faster. The traditional manufacturing would take you a month or even three months with initial prototypes, 3D printing, and CNC machining. However, with Proto Labs, it's about one week initial prototypes, iteration three weeks, and then you can actually finish it. The total time to market is just six months, halving the traditional process of at least 12 months. So they can actually do RP, EB, FDA, VNV, and launch it very fast through Proto Labs. So time saved is six months. 
Another company that I want you to look at is Materialize. Materialize already rose from $11 to $80. Today, it's trading at $70. You kind of miss the boat if you think about it, but if it falls somewhere in the $50, let's understand what Materialize does. Materialize in their own website says that they're always there empowering your 3D printing applications, materialized software, medical, manufacturing. You'll notice that 3D printing additive manufacturing is very huge in these sectors. Now, I said actually in September 2020 when I was discussing desktop metal that, um, that we wanted to buy TRNE. Desktop metal was founded five years ago by leaders in advanced manufacturing, metallurgy, and robotics to make metal 3D printing accessible for engineering and manufacturing. The reality is that Rick Fulop didn't just start five years ago. As you heard, desktop metal, um, even if desktop metal was founded in 2015, the CEO, Rick Fulop, was actually um, a serial entrepreneur. He actually had A123, uh, which is actually a 3D system company as well. In this report, September 21, 2020, I'm going to show to you a few slides in my, um, in my 2020 Awesome Tenex Ideas. These are actually interesting uh, videos to watch, 3D Printing Revolution, 3D Printing Body Parts. It was a Vice documentary on HBO, 3D Printing Humans. Um, and then, of course, we discussed about desktop metal. Desktop metal is actually, so Rick Fulop is actually a native of Venezuela. He is a serial entrepreneur. He actually held, um, before desktop metal, he was A123 Systems. It was a one-time high-flying battery maker. It, it filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2012, ultimately got merged with Chinese ownership. However, you know, he launched Desktop Metal in 2015 with six co-founders, including MIT professor Siet Ming Chang, who had been his same co-founder on A123, and Eli Sachs, the elder statesman of 3D printing, who even coined the phrase 3D, as in three-dimensional printing, in his very first patent, and was even the lead inventor of the binder jet 3D printing technology. So to tell you that Rick Fulop is, um, is a newbie is impossible because he was there in the industry from the start. And you could see that desktop metal, some of the most interesting things that I mentioned in my prior class, which I'm resharing to you, is about their Edgar tool and die. They're sharing the additive manufacturing benefits in today's motor vehicles. With the studio system, we're able to manufacture complex internal shapes. Um, outsourcing would normally take two to three weeks, costing us $300. However, with desktop metal, it's just going to be $45 in five days. Can you imagine? You can produce the, the car faster at a cheaper cost. Amazing. The answer is additive manufacturing. And people like BMW knew about this three years ago. That's why. BMW and Lowe's was among the investors who poured $45 million into desktop metal, the 3D printer startup. In fact, corporations lined up to invest in 3D metal printing startup as early as 2017. That corporation was none other than Alphabet, aka Google Ventures. BMW, GE, Lowe's, and Tektronic Industries are all the corporate backers because they see what we all see, that this is a winner, hashtag winners win. Now, how does the desktop metal IPO benefit the entire 3D printing industry, the entire additive manufacturing? Um, let's take a look at what's happened because of 3D printing desktop metal having a successful SPAC or rather a successful listing in the market. I think that um, it actually allowed us to see the, maybe the potential for continuous composites getting listed next year or next next year. But these are the commentaries that people have been saying. With the successful listing of desktop metal, of course, that is um, a good thing for the entire, entire industry. The CEO of, uh, of some, I, I'll tell you about the other companies that are listed. Stratasys, example. Stratasys and Desktop Metal are actually working hand in hand right now. Instead of competing, they're actually helping each other out. Stratasys, SSYS, said that in an April study, they found that 25% of U.S. manufacturing professionals are planning to change their supply chains in response to the pandemic. And 3D printing was their top choice for tech investments, along with robotics. So there is a very clear growth ahead for this market. That's because 3D printing gives manufacturers adaptability, resilience in the face of uncertainty. 
And we are seeing with Stratasys customers like General Motors and BAE Systems, the pandemic did not create this trend. It is merely helping to accelerate it. We see the longest runway for growth in manufacturing applications and the largest value pool in 3D printed polymers. So we will be introducing new technologies for the polymer segment of additive manufacturing to significantly grow this addressable market. To be clear, there is no silver bullet, additive manufacturing technology, material or application, no leader today across all major segments. Market leadership will come from providing a comprehensive solution set, including multiple 3D printing technology supported by a global go-to-market and service infrastructure. Stratasys is well positioned to be that leader for 3D printed polymers. Now let's take a look at some CEOs telling about them. This is just wow, right? Digital Metal 3D Prints. Digital Metal AB is the pioneer in metal binder jetting. I'll tell you about a few companies that are listed. X1 is listed. John Hartner, the CEO of X1. Let me read to you what he thinks about the desktop metal IPO or SPAC. X1 welcomes all of the attention that new competitors are bringing into the binder jet 3D printing space that we commercialized in 1998. Together, Desktop Metal, Hewlett Packard, and GE are helping to drive awareness of the incredible speed, sustainability, and innovation benefits that binder jet 3D printing has to offer manufacturers. While we are extremely optimistic about the growth prospects of 3D printing and binder jetting overall, our long experience in this sector and ongoing work tells us that the industry CAGR of 25% is absolutely within reach. The X1 team is confident that we will remain the market leaders in this segment, continuing to innovate, advance the technology, and partner with our customers. In 2019, we had revenue of more than $53 million with a backlog in excess of $38 million as of June 30, 2020. Our business has a strong foundation of global customers generating recurring revenue. What's more, the current 3D printers are printing with more than 20 materials with single alloy metals making up half of our lineup. With exciting materials such as aluminum fast track for qualification, we believe that binder jetting will transform the face of production manufacturing of metal, making it faster, smarter, and more sustainable. You actually saw my title piece for desktop metal. I wrote it, full metal alchemist, additive manufacturing, destroying the old production methods. Actually, guys, um, it's kind of like a blacksmith, right? Uh, you just have a really great metal and you can actually turn it into anything you want. Desktop metal was actually awarded in October 7, 2020, a three-year $2.45 million award for, um, for I think, a DOD. I think it's related to Army, Army-related projects. This is the development of a cost-effective, high-volume additive manufacturing process capable of manufacturing cobalt-free hard metals into complex shaped parts without the use of any tooling. Amazing technology. Desktop Metal just three days ago also partnered and acquired Envision Tech for these, uh, and Envision Tech, for all you know, is the leader in dental market with over a thousand dental customers. Those customers are businesses. In fact, um, one of the companies that they are already working with are also um, jewelry companies. So you'll see that Envision Tech already has 5,000 customers including medical device companies, jewelries, automotive, aerospace, and biofabrication. To name drop a few, we're talking about Cartier jewelry. Those watches are probably actually made with desktop metal. Celgene, Ford. Celgene is a health-related company. Ford, some cars, Hasbro, Oral Arts, Stoller, and Smile Direct Club. So Desktop Metal is working with Envision Tech, and they are already hand-in-hand. Hand. The merger is going to close first quarter 2021. Um, in fact, if you want to listen to what Rick Fulop thinks about the Desktop Metal Envision Tech, you can actually watch it there. Um, you can see it in uh, Ameritrade. They actually had an interview with Rick Fulop. Uh, we won't watch that. That's eight minutes. So um, I'll just, um, I just name drop that so that you can watch that for your own time. 
Desktop Meadow was actually a very strong startup or unicorn. As I said, Google Ventures, BMW I Ventures, even the venture arm of Lowe's, they all funded this. Uh, and even other companies like, um, uh, yeah, so they all funded them. Uh, metal 3D printers have always allowed us to have new medical devices, robots, and vehicles. So um, the follow-up sees desktop metal to be a rapid practical application in so many things, especially manufacturing parts. So um, to be honest, the earlier partners were also Saudi Aramco and GE. So they said that desktop metal is working with BMW. They're also working with XJet in Israel. So um, that would be making metal-infused plastic filaments working with standard desktop 3D printers. Long-term, this actually helps solve the warehousing problem parts of automotives and other industries. So very, very huge. Um, it's, it solves a lot of inventory problem. They also said that uh, very huge industries, um, yeah. So let me tell you a few things about X1. X1 said that they were the leader in jet binder. What is jet binders, right? So what is jet binder printing? It says here that Exxon is a company in Pennsylvania, USA. They have actually 50 new metals right now, ceramic composite materials for what they call the binder jet additive manufacturing. Among the materials, they've got 10 single alloy metals, six ceramics, five composite materials. From the outside, it may just look like Exxon's metal printers jump from six to 21 qualified meat materials overnight. In reality, X1's engineering team has not been have been moving so fast to print new materials since 2013, the breakthrough year when we bag, when we began printing the dense single alloy metals, and we haven't slowed down since. Since 2013, we've been growing, and we, we were really trying to do this new material printing. When we took time to reevaluate over the last few months, it's astonishing. We are printing an astonishing number of materials that haven't worked all the way before through the rigorous qualification process. At the same time, we're announcing new materials such as M2 tool steel, such as aluminum and titanium. Amazing. A major reset is needed. Just to tell you, last year, X1 actually joined Additive Manufacturing Consortium to develop oil and gas maritime quality standards. Amazing. They're working with these types of companies. What is this metal binder jetting to begin with? What, let's let the leader explain that to us. When we're talking about binder jetting, what we're really talking about is the fastest, most production-ready form of 3D printing in the world. Binder jet 3D printing can really transform just about any powder, metals, ceramics, sands, even garbage, into highly dense precision parts. And the reason it's so fast, the reason it's so production-ready is really simple. Unlike those other forms of 3D printing where you've got a little tiny laser or a little tiny nozzle putting out small amounts of material, we've got a big wide area print head depositing huge amounts of binder precisely where we need it according to the bitmap we've generated. And on a layer by layer basis, there is absolutely nothing faster. And we can take those green parts and center them all together in a furnace that fuses those particles together. And there's nothing faster, more affordable on a per part basis. Each layer can be printed lightning fast, just like sheets of paper. All 3D printing starts with the digital file, and creating a part for binder jetting is easy and simple. The most important thing to know is that when you eventually center your parts, it's going to shrink, and you're going to need to scale your parts up by about 20% to adjust for that. But once you have your final design, our software automatically nests the parts in the print bed so you can efficiently print as many parts as quickly as possible. In BinderJet 3D printing, powder and powder management is actually one of the most critical parts of the process and one of the most complicated to manage. We're 3D printing the finest cuts of powder out there, ultra-fine MIM powders down to less than 5 microns in size. Think baking flour. And the reason we print these tiny particles is that they give the best bed accuracy, surface finish, and density. Ultimately, this is what gives you the best quality part.
Okay, so let me tell you what happens next. We figured out exactly how to print your files, and now it's time to load it in the machine. On our machines, we have a variety of process settings depending upon what metal you're using, depending upon the substrates and all those settings. These are things we've been refining for years. So let me tell you about one of the most exciting parts of this machine. We've got our own patented direct-to-bitmap software that we use that, that precisely aligns every single drop in our printing engines with every single edge on your part. That's how we hit these tolerances, and uh, that's how the magic happens. We spread that fine layer of powder and then we print these super fine drops on top of it to glue everything together. Those print heads can be running anywhere from 400, 800, 1200 dots per inch, giving you feature sizes, 60 microns, 30 microns, 15 microns. All of this happening in an automated layer overlay way in speeds that are just unheard of. On, some of, on our InEvent Plus, we've got our speeds down to 13 seconds on some of our materials, and we're pushing those limits every single day. This process just gets faster and faster and better and better. So let me tell you a little bit more about this Triple ACT system and what it actually does. Triple ACT brings our bed density deviations to less than 4% across the entire volume. Less than 0.4%. That's kind of an amazing number to get any powder to get that ordered. But what it enables us to do is these incredibly quick print speeds. So this print process works. As I say, it's totally automated. We spread a layer of powder, we print a layer image, and we dry that to get ready for the next layer. And it's lather, rinse, repeat, over and over, layer over layer, and before you know it, you've got those parts and they're ready for the curing. There are a lot of questions about curing and why we do that. So in binder jet additive, what we're actually printing is a liquid glue. And once it gets into the powder bed, that's not quite enough to hold everything together. So we have to set it thermally. And when we run it through our thermal setting process, I stopped it right there. You can actually watch it. The ticker, uh, sorry, the title is What is Metal Binder Jetting? There's a lot. You can learn about 3D core and mold printing as well. I'm just going to try to turn off my video first. Uh, it might help on the connection. Wait, stop this. Hello? I'm just afraid of getting disconnected. All right. So this is the important parts. You notice that they have 25 new material. This is uh, all the alloy and all the metals. You could see that everyone would love to actually produce and manufacture so many things. And so these are interesting uh, videos to watch. What is metal additive manufacturing? What can it do? In summary, it's actually producing a massive scale of uh, cost, cost efficiencies for the entire world. I want you to see the applications, guys. So um, the reality check, uh, this is a 2017 video. All it's really saying is how cheap additive manufacturing will impact all of our um, industries, all the traditional manufacturing industries. So it's actually being said that it's not a luxury, it's actually a necessity. Uh, that is a very good video. I'm sharing here how some people are using 3D printing, the applications. It is becoming a major asset in the energy industry. We all know that Biden is all in when it comes to clean energy. We all know that China is also all in. Europe is also all in. The entire world and even the entire global uh, Fortune 500 is all in for carbon neutral uh, 2050. Okay, so carbon neutral 2050 world. And so the only way that we can actually reduce the cost of these solar panels is thanks to additive manufacturing. They could be even more efficient than your traditional solar panels. Dr. Um, Ken Washington, who is the chief technology officer of Ford Motor Company, said that, um, yeah, so he's basically off the agreement with desktop metals, and that's why actually Ford and desktop metals has a huge partnership together. He also served as Lockheed Martin's first chief privacy officer. So he's very good in terms of these um, emerging mobility opportunities and what additive manufacturing's role is in this front. X1, what is binder jetting? The fastest form of 3D printing for metal, ceramics, and more. If you take a look at the website, 
all that they're saying is they can transform industrial powder into parts and tooling. It was an initial development as early as 1990s. So um, we are getting into the additive manufacturing 2.0. And when you take a look at the forecast, guys, we're seeing that these are the biggest leaders. You've got Arcam, EOS, X1, Renishaw, SLM Solutions, Concept Laser, Phoenix Systems. You're noticing that some of the companies that we even mentioned aren't even here. Desktop Metal, Continuous Composites, etc. So I think that the world is still uh, trying to assume who is the biggest here. And uh, there's still um, no one clear. EOS is a very great company as well. Take note that EOS is one of the leading 3D printer manufacturers. They announced their ongoing support for the Texas Rocket Engineering Lab. So they're working with um, creating rockets. Uh, it's even done a $1 million student design challenge. A while ago, you saw actually car companies uh, paying people for their great designs and they're printing those designs. Um, this one, EOS, is actually providing a million dollars to the great designers who will actually want to design a rocket ship. So Patrick Boyd, the marketing director of EOS, stated that the, the space industry heavily relies on 3D printing. Actually, just to give you a, a, a fact, no? um, isn't it that you all know that uh, ArcSpace has an ArcSpace fund? The reality is the ArcSpace Fund would likely have a lot of 3D printing because um, 3D printing or additive manufacturing stocks, materialized proto labs, um, X1, uh, my assumption is they will be there. Uh, why? Strata says desktop metal, because these are the ones that are going to have form fit and customized. Uh, in rocket ships, you don't always produce that every day. Therefore, you actually need a 3D printing or additive manufacturing partner to really uh, do those space exploration. So the pipeline to advancing that industry, if you're gonna ask me um, where uh, where those arc space invest funds would be, if, like, uh, if, uh, if billions of dollars would flow into the space fund, it would be um, a lot of that flow would actually go to some 3D printing or additive manufacturing companies. So this is the base 11 space challenge uh, being developed by TREL. So EOS is actually working with that for the rockets of Havoc engine. Just wanted you to know that um, those are the things that uh, are happening. This is important. The industry is now using Microsoft HoloLens. That would be a wearable and metal 3D printing so that you can implant an eye socket. This is actually January 8, 2021, about two weeks ago. I want to share to you this exact video on how medical surgeons are using both the wearable industry and the additive manufacturing plus 5G to in order in order to do this. Let me show you this augmented reality surgical success. Watch this. Two minutes. Hope it works. Every day. Surgeons rely on information from X-rays, CT scans, MRIs, and other patient records to determine the surgical requirements and the procedures they will employ to achieve the best patient outcomes. During a procedure, surgeons are often required to step away from the patient to view these images and records. Imagine if those same records could easily appear right in front of the surgeon's eyes without taking their hands or their attention away from the surgical field. Allow the surgeon to procedures. Latin America's first surgical procedure utilizing see-through holographic lenses was performed successfully by the renowned orthopedic surgeon Dr. Abraham Del Real. This system was developed through a bold partnership between Accenture, Sky Group, and Christus Health Excellence and Innovation Center. Since the procedures and the press coverage of its success, there has been a surge in requests from patients, surgeons, and hospital systems, and plans are underway to expand throughout the Americas.
It is one of the many ways Accenture is using augmented reality to transform the ways we work and live. I understand it's dinner time. I'm sorry, I ate some. Mm. So recently, you saw the stock 3D systems. 3D systems doubled from 11 to $20, and it even hit $30. Why did it double in the first place? They actually sold some of their business units that were not core part of their business. Um, the truth is a lot of 3D printing systems had gone 30% or 100% or even 200%, even in just a, some of them are actually 300% in just a span of three months. Um, in this case, the news was about 3D systems actually selling all of their um, non-core businesses and making them debt free. With the sale, they can actually already start um, their, their real focus, their core businesses, which are, uh, which are actually on the medical medical side, medical breakthroughs. So today, uh, rapid um, rapid advances on additive manufacturing, um, you'll notice that they, they, they've finished the hype phase. You'll notice that um, it is meticulous fixing. It used to be like 3D systems. You've probably heard of 3D, TDD. Um, this used to be a very, I don't know, I guess it was a hype phase around 2006 all the way to about 2016. Um, and, and, and it fizzled, of course, because at that point in time, the technology was not yet as um, as it is today. However, um, you could see that the Herculean task behind the scenes of 3D systems is now coherent, stable, and de de dependable. So <clears throat> there are a lot of interesting things happening in the industry. Let me just show to you a few of them. So you already saw Proto Labs. This is desktop metal. Um, you could see all the clientele of desktop metal. The materials, the resources, investors, you'll see that all the industries are part of them. Automotive, consumer goods, machine design, education. I think today the largest um, listed, let's take a look at the market caps of each of them. Um, so you've got X1. So X1 market cap. The market cap of X1, oh, sorry, not that, not Exxon Mobile. I'm talking about X1. Mm, soon. So take note at the market caps. Um, X O N E. This is not right. Five hundred million dollars only. Really? Let's see. Mm, possible. It's possible because they fell. All of them fell for the, from their past um, past heights. Only recently, they've been rising, right? X1 has rallied from about $8 to $21. That would be this November to December. But you'll notice that these are actually on the verge of a, of a super secular trend. X1 has, has, has been listed around, I think this was 2013. Not so sure if that was 2013. From about $20, high face to as high as $70, fell down to as low as about $6, $7, slept for the last seven, eight years. But recently, as people realized the application of additive manufacturing as a core ingredient, not just of electric vehicles, but I think that most people already assume that the, the biggest beneficiary of additive manufacturing was electric vehicles. Um, that is true. Um, take note that I am of a believer in electric revolution, therefore electric revolution, solar energy, and in a way, think about it, who's going to produce those cars at a cheap cost is a factory. And that factory has a lot of robots and that robot will enable your car to be cheap that would have to be working with some additive manufacturing. So Ford uses some um, Ford works with desktop metal. General Motors works with uh, Stratasys. Uh, X1, who are the who are the partners of X1? So you've heard that they're working with some oil and gas companies. I think that these are the ones that you're actually trying, you, you have to um, at the very least understand. This is from a technical charting perspective, a breakout from $17. Very, very strong move from about 2015, 2014. 
we're talking about a five-year massive breakout. Usually, I'll just give you a technical understanding. 17 minus about four, that would be a $13 range. That means that the market assumes that this is going to go run up until 30. And that is just technical targeting. If there is a fundamental change here, I think that the market will see this go from $10 or $7 tier or even $3 all the way to about $50 at the very least. So you've got these resistances at $49 to $50. That's very clear. So this is a $400 million company. If you think that it's going to be at least $5 billion next five years, that is a 10x move or about $20 to $200. Remember awesome 10x when you make 10x your money. All right. Okay. Let's talk about desktop metal. Indeed, desktop metal is already very high, already trading at $5 billion, expensive. However, as you know, desktop metal has so many, um, so many partners today. Uh, for those who aren't aware who the partners of Desktop Metal is, you can actually go to their investors' presentation. They are working with your Ford. They're working with your BMW. They're working with um, with Adidas. So there's a lot. They they just bought that um, that dental and vision tech. So they're working with Cartier. So industry-wise, they know where they're good at. Automotive, education, consumer goods, machine design, all of them are actually partners with um, Desktop Metal. So you'll notice that if you learn more about the company, it isn't surreal why market caps of, um, of Desktop Metal is trading at $5 billion. One would even argue that it's still cheap even at $5 billion. Let's take a look at some more Stratasys. Okay, let's take a look at Stratasys. Stratasys is also having their values, uh, their values go up. Why? Because of the entire sector, right? From about before here at about trading at 17, it rallied on its hype phase to as high as $140. And then, of course, the hype didn't sustain all the way down back to about $17. Today, I think the market sees that the market knows that this hype was not fake, that we can actually sustain this hype phase again. From about $11 here, today it's trading at $36. Can we see it rise as high as about $40 to $50 at the very least? Awesome Tenex thinks so. Any drops of Stratasys, 36 is, thir is going to be limited in my view to about $30. In fact, we mentioned a lot about these 3D printing names as early as about October, November. So around October, November, I was already seeing that people were already buying this at about 12 and 13 actually. So um, it's already triple. And uh, you can notice that there was a lot of news happening in this sector. In fact, here from about $20, it immediately rose 50% Stratasys. Let me read to you the news on why 3D printing stocks were soaring. All right. So some analysts are bearish. However, we think that that move is actually about accelerate accelerate expansion into mass production, the acquisition of origin. Stratasys completes the origin buyout to fuel 3D printing. So right now, you're seeing a lot of acquisitions. <clears throat> acquire here, acquire there. Um, because, you know, Rick Fulop today has 5 billion market cap. You might as well acquire other companies that's just $100 million. You know, if Continuous Composites was just bought out by Rick Fulop, I, um, I wouldn't disagree with the market cap because it's going to be the leader of everything in my view. Stratasys completes acquisition of origin, accelerating expansion into mass production additive manufacturing. This is January 5. It happened just about um, two or three weeks ago. Or Origin's resin-based photopolymer technology addresses the fast-growing demand for tooling and the end-use parts across multiple applications. You heard it right. Uh, there are so many opportunities for mass production, and they are the first choice for polymer 3D printing. Origin is a pioneering a new approach to additive manufacturing of end-use parts. And they're actually founded in 2015, led by alumni from Google and Apple. Take note that Origin has investors, including Floodgate, DCM, Mandra Capital, Haystack, Stanford University. Learn more about them on Origin IO. So let's take a look what Origin IO does so that we can understand what Stratasys just acquired. We are joining forces with Stratasys to usher in the next era of additive manufacturing. Origin and Stratasys, they're now, of course, they were featured in Fast Company as well. Exception one, accuracy and consistency. We can big build and small footprint. So they can do all these. Optimize build volume, precise orchestrate light temperature and other conditions 
produce features less than 50 nanometer in size. Uh, uh, I thought, tama no? Nanometer ba ba sa Or, I don't know, but, but really micrometer in size with high accuracy materials. So welcome to the open additive manufacturing. World-class materials exceed injection model strength. World-class materials like these. So built for volume, price for scale, lowest risk, lower risk, redundant sourcing of critical materials lowers the chance of supply interruptions. So yun, um, very huge. Um, the dimensions are small, so small, additive mass production. So high throughput combined with unmatched part-to-part -part consistency so that you can launch faster while maintaining minimal inventory. Those are things that actually any operations manager would love to hear about. So I believe that these industries are wonderful. The science behind them is wonderful. Let's take a look at Stratasys market cap today. It's just a $2 billion company. Um, it doubled actually from about when, when the when the company wasn't releasing that origin was just twenty dollars, almost double now at thirty six dollars. However, as you could see, the market is seeing that twelve to thirty six is triple, from about seven hundred million dollars to two billion. I don't think that it has really reached that peak, no. I think that it can even go as high as about let's say five to seven billion dollars at the very least. What's gonna be the catalyst? Really, you're gonna have to wait for more customers to use Stratasys as part of the contracts. So just like desktop metal getting contracts, I do think that um, the key to the to the stock price rising is just really more contracts and more revenues. Uh, more revenues because in a way, I see them as an OEM beneficiary, original equipment manufacturer beneficiary. Anything you need to produce, you're probably going to give that project um, OEM to companies like them. So that's one of my underlying secular trends on why I think that additive manufacturing is going to have a blast of 2021 and beyond. So if you've invested in them 2020, I think that in 2021, hashtag winners win, any drops of Stratasys X1 are also great opportunities to buy. Now, of course, you heard me say Nano Dimension already. Nano Dimension is already a $2 billion company. We mentioned about it at about $2.25. Today, it's already $12.60 at time six. Um, I think it already prints for, um, for space-related stuff. So <clears throat> the thing about it is that I think so many people are already aware of Nano Dimension, so I'm not going to highlight it again. What I want to highlight are companies that people didn't discuss much. So you know that DDD... Triple D has just uh, eliminated their debts. In fact, when they eliminated, el eliminated their debts, similarly, that $10 went $300 or $30. So times three in just this month, yes, for January. So it times three, it's like a $3 billion increase just by the fact that they sold $60 million. Um, they just really had, um, they sold. So basically no more debt. In a way, I understand why people are saying that these 3D printing related names have gone up so fast, so soon. Um, there aren't contracts yet. However, um, that's why I had to explain what's happening in the industry. It could actually fall. But at the same time, when you try to take a look at research today, additive manufacture and polymers for space exploration, there's so much actually that's not being tapped right now. Most people are actually seeing that um, these companies are mostly just relocated for um, prototyping um, or even working on some specific niche projects, medical devices for proto labs. Yeah, but um, I don't believe so. It's not going to be a very little market. I believe with the same, um, same bullishness of the CEOs of Stratasys, X1, uh, and Desktop Metal, I believe in what they're saying that they're going to uh, get a 25% CAGR. So if you want to check out th those presentations, just go to Desktop Metal. Um, and for those who are new here, please know that we have an Awesome 10X Inner Circle class every day. In fact, Desktop Metal was mentioned in our Awesome 10X Inner class. It's not in a free Friday class pick. So we mentioned about how great these uh, technologies are in order for us to actually invest in them. I mentioned about that September, October as well. So I reiterated buying actually TRNE, aka desktop metal, especially when it was still trading at about $10 to $11. Um, but even today, as you could see, they're talking about the cost per part for mass production. They're talking about 100 times cheaper, um, 100 times faster speeds these are some, some of the slides that I'm just sharing to you. 
FDM printing was the past. Was it's this is the past. This is additive manufacturing 1.0. We are already um, in 2.0. So metal 3D printing systems make metal 3D printing accessible for engineers and manufacturers. Take a look at the kinds of companies that they're working with. I'm pretty sure that the reason why GE is working with them is for wind turbines. I mean, I'm not pretty sure, but probably highly confident that it's going to be part of that. Affordable, 10 times cheaper, powder bed fusion versus the DM studio system. So you could see that I don't see any company able to match the moats of desktop metal. And that's the reason perhaps why people are already assigning such a premium to desktop metal versus the rest. So much applications, automotive, um, you've seen these already. Ford is already a partner with a studio system. Ford is working with uh, desktop metal for those additive parts. Amazing. These are the customers, Renault, BMW, Continental, to name a few. Do you believe that the next frontier of revolution stands with, um, with these types of companies? I hope that your portfolio will reflect the future. Awesome 10X wants you to actually believe in the future and to replace the old, the old, the traditional, the dinosaurs that have to be extinct. So we can do lighter, cheaper, 3D printed parts, learn more about continuous fiber. It's amazing. It's amazing technology. We can actually print heart. We can print an artificial heart, heart pump. We can print an artificial ear. There's so much technology right now um, that I, and this is the continuous fiber 3D systems. That is continuous composite, very, very huge. Um, I think that if, if it ever get listed, I mean, you should be happy to own a, a great piece of technology of the world. These are really uh, game changing companies. They're gonna save a lot of uh, costs. So, just to give you a few understanding, just a, a fast look on the costs. Um, yeah, I think like most of you will have to just watch and take a look at desktop metal to discuss to you all the opportunities that additive manufacturing will do. Um, initially, of course, the biggest pie would be on automotives. You've seen how LiDAR went up because of how, how linked LiDAR and um, LiDAR is to a lot of these electric vehicles. Right now, I think the market has been setting up a premium to all the electric vehicles, courtesy of Tesla. But it's also um, telling you that the revolution is helping everyone. So because electric vehicles is so huge, which industries are benefiting on all of that? Think about it. LiDAR is one. Solar is one. Um, of course, additive manufacturing, in my view, is another beneficiary. Hope you learned something today and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share Awesome 10X to your friends. Bye-bye.